Good afternoon from London, and good evening to those of you who are joining us from India, and good morning to those uh, joining us from the west coast or the, or the east coast of the United States. My name is Eric Bergloff. I'm the director of the LSE Institute of Global Affairs at the LSE School of Public Policy. You're most welcome to this webinar on early lessons from the Indian experience of fighting COVID-19. This is part of a series on COVID-19 we are organizing together with the Center uh, for Economic Policy Research and the LSE School of Public Policy. On Tuesday, Prime Minister Modi announced a massive economic stimulus package to help the Indian economy recover from the double shock of the medical emergency and the external domestic impact from the virus. We have yet to see all the details of the package, but if it holds what it promises, it is one of the largest relative to GDP in the emerging and developing world. But again, we have to look at, at the details and we'll have a chance to discuss uh, today what we know as of now, which actually may not be as much as we would like, but uh, we, we, will, we will see. This stimulus comes after the sudden and very strict lockdown of the economy starting at midnight on March 25th. People were told not to step outside their houses. We all saw the images of migrant workers having to make their own way uh, back to their villages. The early evidence is that the epidemic curve has been suppressed, but there are massive concerns about the impact of the economy uh, and particularly those most vulnerable, and most of them working in the informal sector. How will the new program reach these vulnerable groups is one issue that we will certainly discuss. The general lockdown come, came after, the indiv after individual states had implemented their own partial and, and very different lockdown policies. And individual states also differ dramatically in how they have been able to reach those most vulnerable. Add to these the differences between urban and rural areas within states and, and between different parts of the country's mega cities. So there are, we want to look at these differences and see what we can learn from this diversity of experience and what we can say about the interaction also between the central government and the states uh, from, from this experience. But the Indian experience is also interesting from a global perspective. Many countries in the emerging and developing world are also emulating policies from advanced economies. In fact, on the Oxford measure of stringency, stringency emerging and developing economies are outperforming advanced economies, at least on paper. But the sacrifice of people in terms of lost income, often without significant savings or safe, social safety net, are much greater. Yet these policies remain remarkably popular, at least according to admittedly imperfect polling data. How should we understand these observations? And what should be done to protect those most vulnerable? Many of these countries have little or no fiscal space and they lack channels to reach large parts of the population. How can we design policies that balances the need to suppress the virus and that to prevent people from dying from starvation? We have a magnificent panel to help us navigate these difficult issues and understand the complex Indian context. Let me introduce them briefly. And actually one of them have not yet joined. So I hope that she will join um, as we could, uh, proceed. Uh, that is um, Yamini Ayar, president of, um, and executive director of the Center for Policy Research. I notice that often in, in India, CEPR and CEPR uh, are, are confused, partly because of, of um, the, the way it's being pronounced. But one of the most, this is one of the most important think tanks in India. And of course, uh, Yamini is also importantly an LSE alumna. The, the next speaker is, 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 or the, is the Professor Korshik Basu. He's the former chief economist um, of the World Bank. He was before that also um, chief economic advisor of the Indian government. He's currently a professor at Cornell University and president of the International Economic Association. Korshik normally lives in New York, but uh, as he was visiting uh, India when the lockdown was announced, he's still locked down, I understand, in Mumbai. Ashwini Jaspanda is a professor of economics at the rapidly rising Ashoka University, a very successful effort to build a liberal arts college in, in India. Professor Mitresh Gatak is a colleague of mine in the economics department at the LSE. And last but not least, Debra Rai 
is a professor at New York University, and he's one of the authors of a recent CPR policy insight discussing the Indian uh, response to COVID-19. And we're going to base some of the discussion today on, on that particular publication. Before I hand over to Deborah, uh, I just want to say that we will leave ample room for uh, Q&A after the discussion within the panel. So without further ado, uh, can I hand this over to you, the bride? Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, shall I just go ahead then? Yes, yeah, please. Go. Okay. Good morning from New York, from the epicenter, uh, or one of the epicenters. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, but before that, I'll at least show you that New York is still alive and kicking. Uh, so there you are. So my, my job is to give just a little bit of a background to this, uh, to this discussion. So... Um, uh, this is based on a couple of papers I've been working on with uh, Laura van der Waller and, and, and S. Subramaniam. And you can email me for, for, for more uh, if you want to see details here. You guys know all about this stuff, but let me, j j just for you to have some background, this is the timeline for India's lockdown. It looks very much like the timeline for lockdowns in most countries. Uh, sporadic cases at the end of January, uh, speeding up in March. Uh, by mid-March, there was 100 cases, and then with the power of exponential growth, 1,000 cases at the end of March. Um, India was a bit busy at the time. You know, uh, President Trump was visiting, there were communal riots, uh, and so forth. So it was a little bit slow to the party. But in the end, a 14-hour Janata curfew, a curfew of the people, was, was, was issued on March 22nd with lots of banging of pots and pans. Uh, and then the lockdown, which uh, started on March 24th, and now with two extensions have gone up to May 18th. Uh, and there's a lockdown 4.0, which is forthcoming, apparently, with new, new rules that we don't know about. These are pictures that you've all seen. This is four hours of notice. Uh, people at the Bandra railway station uh, trying to get home. You know, India's lockdown has been a model lockdown. It's been implemented with unexpected or even brutal uh, uh, efficiency. If you, if you go to the website of the government of India, you will see that India is now classified into zones. There are these sort of green, red, orange zones, containment zones. And then there's a list of activities which are permitted in, in, in each of these uh, zones. So the activities that are prohibited nationally, the movement of people of different kinds in the different zones. So it's... Uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very seriously imposed lockdown. Now, what I want to talk about really here is, is try to parse out why India has been so incredibly efficient in, in generating and, and implementing a lockdown, while at the same time, it's been so silently deficient on its relief measures. And this is the, I think this is the tension that I want to bring out for the panel to kind of discuss. So I want to put up this sort of this notion that's been going around in my head, the idea of the visible and the invisible. So, um, you know, the world has honed on to COVID-19 with sort of laser-like ferocity, right? Now, everybody has been talking about it. Um, it it's, it it's, it's the correct thing to do in most of the West to actually lock down. Um, there's a motley crew of libertarians and Marx, mask spurners and, of course, business interests on the other side who want to open the economy up. But, but the angle is that a lockdown is the right thing to do. Now, when I think about this from the perspective of India, I'm not, I'm not at all sure. And the reason I'm not at all sure is because of this particular mix of, 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 of brutal enforcement and, uh, and, and deficiency on the relief measures. Now, I want to tell you one, one of the reasons, you know, the, I want you to look at this column in red, which is what is called the case fatality rate, right? The case fatality rate on, on COVID-19 through the world has, looks extremely high, alarmingly high, right? And of course, as every economist and statistician already knows, these case fatality rates are actually misleading because they don't take into account the vast base of infections that, uh, that we have. So the actual fatality rates are quite low, but this is what comes out very clearly in the press. So if you see, you know, the world average case fatality rate now is 7%, right? 4 million cases, uh, 280,000 people dead, right? But you see this um, uh, all, all through, right? And this has sort of even sharpened this focus on COVID-19 as a source of visible deaths. India, by the way, at the bottom, uh, has a very low case fatality rate, and that's, that may be something that we may want to discuss uh, later on. 
So in short, you know, the uh, COVID-19 lives are, or deaths are highly visible. Yeah. Whereas, you know, um, when we think about the opposite, and now in developed countries, the opposite is essentially a question of livelihoods. It's a question of economics, right? And then the epidemiologists uh, are very clear on this, that there's no contest. There's lives on the one side and economics on the other. No contest, right? Um, similarly, would echo any lockdown government, right? No contest. Or our, our dear governor, Andrew Cuomo, uh, has said, you know, how much is a human life worth? To me, I say a human life is priceless, period, right? Now, but when you, come, when you come to a country like India, when you come to most poor countries, it's not a question of lives versus livelihoods. It's really a question of lives versus lives, okay? Or to be more precise, it's a question of visible lives versus invisible lives, right? And what I want to argue is that these lives which are lost through violence, starvation, indebtedness, stress, these are invisible objects in the sense that they're going to diffuse into a variety of different categories. And of course, the intrepid statistician or the economist will be able to pick them up on her radar screen, right, by, by, by probing these numbers. But to the public, this is generally going to be lost. And so that induces a visibility bias on the part of the government, which I think is very important in terms of understanding what is going on. I think my claim is therefore that the Indian government can really be best understood through this lens of a visibility bias. Uh, this is something that I've just taken from, uh, from a website which is uh, run by a group of excellent volunteers. Um, you can go, I've given you the link at the bottom. This sort of tracks the signature of non-COVID non deaths. Now the signature of non-COVID deaths is actually quite interesting because obviously there's an initial bump as the migrants are going back, there's deaths from suicide, there's deaths from domestic violence, but it doesn't have an exponential signature unlike the COVID-19 death signature, right? Which is initially highly exponential and then sort of flattens out. And what I think is to be expected from this is that these long run effects, right? Namely starvation and indebtedness are just going to pick up as the months go by but it's not immediate, it's not in your face. So it's against this background that, you know, I want to think a little bit about how the Indian government has been targeting uh, for the purposes of relief. And, um, you know, th there's a variety of lists and th these people can discuss. For example, there's the JDY list, which is part of a financial inclusion list, uh, which is a list of bank accounts that, uh, that is roughly correlated only roughly, I should add, right, with per capita income. Similarly, there are correlates like the public distribution system list, the, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme list, which is the sort of list of job card holders. And then there's a much tinier list, which is the below poverty line list, right? So this is the sort of the lists that a government can potentially target for transfers. Now, let's see what the Indian government did. So there's really two plans that, that, that we should be aware of. Plan one is the one that was announced just after the initial lockdown, and plan two was the one that was announced yesterday, and I think that's, that's what we want to discuss in more detail. Now, I want to say that plan one really had a bunch of transfers in them, okay? but the amount is small. The amount is about 1.7 trillion rupees. That's roughly under 1% of GDP, and this is the kind of stuff that was in plan one, right? So there were transfers to these JDY account holders. Uh, there was heightened sort of grain and, and pulse distribution. There was a hike in the minimum wage for the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme and so forth. There was distribution of gas cylinders and so forth. Now, when you even look at this plan, which is a small plan, right? It's by, by the broad scheme of things, there's not much going on here, right? Um, but even these plans, when you examine them carefully, give you much cause for concern. For instance, you know, I've highlighted two things over here. What is this about highlighting? Uh, what is this about hiking the minimum wage on the rural employment guarantee scheme from 182 rupees to 202 rupees a day when the damn employment scheme is not working? Okay, we're just about now starting up the employment scheme again. So if you take the imputed stuff out from here, uh, or for example, the one time payment of 2000 rupees to 87 million farmers, this was already in the Indian government budget. Okay? So if you take these objects out, 
then the package falls even shorter. It goes down to about 0.6% of GDP. So that's the sort of background that we are talking about where I'm, I'm really struck by the, by the efficiency of one face of the government and the reluctance uh, or on, on, or, or on the other side. Okay? Um, and I want to say that, you know, if you go on to, uh, you know, other stuff, I know I have only a minute or so left, uh, but I just want to say that, you know, uh, all sorts of state power, states within the, within the Indian system have been weakened by center actions. For example, uh, you know, no corporate social funds can be received into state coffers. So states are very much starved now of money with which to actually combat uh, 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 this crisis. In the background, protective labor laws have been weakened. We've had eight hour work days extended in several states to 12 hour work days. Right? Uh, they are trapped migrants who have to buy their own tickets to get back. And I, I just want to tell you one anecdote uh, here, which I think is quite interesting, which you're seeing on your screen. There was a bunch of poor Indian revenue service officers, I shouldn't call them poor, they were the prominent Indian revenue service officers, who had suggested to raise the marginal tax on incomes uh, to cover some of the costs of this crisis. And then uh, you see this quotation at the bottom, right, from Scroll, who said that the Central Board of Direct Taxes issued charge sheets against C three senior uh, uh, Indian Revenue Service officials, and that they were suspended and given 15 days to write a written reply, just because they had brought up the idea of raising taxes. So that's the kind of background in which we are, uh, which we are engaged over here. Now, uh, I'm going to end by a very quick description of Relief Plan 2, which we are going to talk about. It's 10 times bigger, okay? Uh, there is, instead of 1.7 uh, trillion uh, rupees, we're talking about 20 trillion rupees. So we're talking about roughly 10% of GDP. And the details of these plans, well, not the details, but some of the indications of these plans were announced yesterday by the finance minister. I've been going through them. It's, um, I have to say, disappointing at first glance. So here, uh, here we go. I just want to show you a, a, a couple of items here. Uh, there, it's essentially a supply side plan, which is expanding liquidity to all sorts of uh, private sector. Now, there, there are small, you know, there are small firms also involved here, but they're essentially liquidity infusions. There's very little happening on the fiscal side, which is really what we need uh, to stimulate the economy. Right, so we need classic Keynesianism over here, right? But just to give you an idea of the magnitudes, if you look at the first item, collateral free loans uh, to these are micro, small, and medium enterprises, just that loan, those loans, right, are double the entire expenditure on transfers in plan one. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what, uh, you know, what the scale of this second plan is. And uh, these items, expedited income tax refunds, are they, part, are they going to be accounted for in the number uh, 20 trillion? Uh, uh, what about uh, uh, something like postponed taxes, which is item five? Are they going to be accounted for implicitly in the number 20 trillion? Um, and then there are things like, you know, 0 0.9 trillion for power distribution companies. All of these numbers are enormous numbers, right? So in, 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 in the context of what? Uh, we've been talking about before. I could find one item, and finally I thought, okay, from PM Cares. Now this is the new fund that's been set up by the Prime Minister for which corporations get their social responsibility deductions, right? Okay, 0 0.01 trillion for migrants, right? Um, compare it with any of these other numbers that you can see up there, and you'll see how small it is that, uh, that, uh, that uh, transfers are as a percentage of this new plan. Okay, so um, as I said, a final point, all of these are supply side stimuli. Right? So I just want to uh, end my initial remarks by saying that um, as Eric pointed out, you know, if you go by stringency trackers, I'm not sure exactly what a stringency, stringency tracker is, but uh, the University of Oxford has one of them. India's right at the top, okay, or near the top. We're doing great in terms of enforcing lockdowns with, with savage efficiency, right? But this is only to be matched by India's incompetence or inability or unwillingness to engage in serious 
targeted transfers. Um, as a result of this, Subbu and I had proposed uh, a different alternative, which I don't want to go into now as, as we are out of time. But if we have time, I can come back. I'm just teasing that one for you, and we can come back to that. Okay, I'll stop there, Eric. You have thank, to th thank you very much, uh, Debrad. Uh, Mitresh, what are your comments on what was just said and what has been announced by the government? Um, no, I think the you know, I, I thought if Debraj were to make another of his final comments, we would have pretty much a, a comprehensive coverage of all the topics. So that was a really, really uh, nice and exhaustive uh, discussion of, of, of the very salient issues. So coming to, um, you know, some of the specific reactions to, I will focus on, on the relief package that was announced. So if you look at, uh, and again, Debraj gave a very, uh, very nice summary of both the initial announcement and, and, and what it uh, consisted of and, and the subsequent one. But one of the main points that has been noted already, because uh, you know, one, one, one thing should be clarified, which was not clear, uh, is it's still going on. You know, we had the prime minister give a speech a couple of days ago, um, you know, two days ago. And then we had the finance minister yesterday gave a major speech, which mostly, you know, that's where most of the numbers are uh, being discussed. But today there was an announcement just about, you know, um, uh, earlier in the day, uh, while, while before we started. So the bottom line is that if you look at the uh, package and the 10% number of GDP, 20 lakh crores, these are all impressive sounding things. But if you really uh, chip on, uh, chip away at, at the various components, and, 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 and I, I, I very much agree with Debraj's overall assessment about the compositional aspects of those things, but even if you look at the scale of it, you clearly have a bunch of it is just basically monetary policy related measures. So according to at least one initial estimate, if you take out the earlier announcement, as well as this monetary policy uh, type things, which are really under the preserve of the Reserve Bank of India, which may not be uh, formally uh, independent, but it is, it is uh, by, by it, 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 it enjoys a fair degree of operational uh, independence, then we are really down to less than 50% of the announced sum. So therefore, whatever is this 20 lakh crore thing, so we are actually you know, down uh, quite a bit from, from that, if you just take those away. And then, of course, if you put in the magnifying lens as to what is are the things in terms of you know um, uh, the collateral free loans uh, versus how much of it is the direct transfers that are going to go to inform informal sector workers or direct relief to various families, we are really looking at relatively small numbers. So my that is my first kind of general point that we have to look at the fine print very carefully. And therefore, it's very easy to get into this 20 lakh crore is a kind of, you know, it, it's, it's a really 10% of GDP. These are big bang uh, kind of headline attracting announcements. But we really have to like, you know, the proverbial fine print as to what's really going to be released. And, and that's sort of my first point. The second point, again, this will not surprise anybody uh, who, who uh, has been thinking or working on the broad area of uh, public policy, you know, money is only a necessary condition to do anything, right? So, of course, it's an important first step to allocate the budgets. But so far, we have been hearing lots of stories, whether about the public distribution system, you know, in terms of, um, you know, again, we already have uh, Debraj mentioned the coverage of that leaves uh, it's uh, leaves quite a bit of the vulnerable population outside his ambit and indeed the migrant workers because the ration cards are not portable uh, some of their extreme suffering was really uh, caused by the fact that they were really cut off from subsistence uh, supplies which had they been in their resident villages at least maybe would have been mitigated by uh, by their uh, local availability of whether through the ration system or to their family and, and social networks, right? Just the sheer subsistence needs and so on. So I would say that therefore we really have to work in terms of uh, the institutional microstructure that would ensure whether it's the public distribution system, whether we are talking about the cash transfers to the uh, Jandhan account that again was uh, mentioned in Debraj's kind of uh, comprehensive overview. 
we have to really, and there have been lots of case studies that have already come up uh, with, uh, with some Yale researchers have already shown that many of those bank transfer uh, things have been subject to logistical problems. So the money should have been there, but people trek all the way from their villages to get their meager 500 rupees. And there are really heart-rending stories of them that is because of some glitches, they don't get it. So I would say, you know, uh, we, we all, you know, as I said, that nobody's saying money is not important. You know, it's a first step to allocate the budget, but effectiveness of resources, uh, you know, how they actually reach the beneficiaries. I think that's the second point. And that's where a lot more care, this is careful, tedious work. It's not headline grabbing. It's not kind of grand announcements and so on. And this is the kind of stuff that, for example, in lots of ways dealing with this crisis, the government, state government of Kerala has shown how certain, you know, very careful planning and certain institutional kind of, you know, uh, investments can pay off in terms of dealing with this um, uh, with a problem like this one. My third general reaction uh, to the broad themes that, that we are discussing is the following, that we also have to keep in mind that, you know, uh, first is money and how much money is really there. Second is, you know, subject to the money that has been put in there, however small, how effectively they're reaching the beneficiaries. The third is, what's the big picture here? What's the big picture in terms of where the policy, you know, framework uh, should be dealing with? What are the problems? You know, clearly the first front line of the problem is the public health crisis. So therefore, leaving everything aside, resources, we just read stories about Bombay uh, hospitals being kind of, you know, already reaching their capacity, right? So therefore, again, none of these have easy fixes. And in a way, all countries are dealing with it. But whether it's the PPE, whether it's medical equipment of various kinds, ventilators, etc. So that's where I think, you know, we have to you kind know, of in terms of having an overall policy framework, that should be the first line of kind of, you know, focus of policy in terms of, you know, there's no way to dodge that, whether rich or poor, you know, the public health system is, is being, uh, is, is, there's a lot of pressure put on that. Number two is, again, I think uh, the initial remarks very comprehensively covered, so I will just, you know, mention it, but will not belabor it is the indirect problem in a country, any country, but especially in a country like India, where um, you know, people, uh, there's a big fraction of the population that lives in the margins of subsistence. And therefore, even leaving aside the public health crisis, you genuinely have a kind of you know, uh, um, a problem of hunger and, 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 and real uh, danger of mortality uh, out of those things that could, you know, uh, could uh, rival uh, what, what could happen from the first order you know, impact of this uh, health problem, right? So therefore, we have to uh, think about in terms of any co coherent policy frame. Number three has to be the essential way to approach the economic restarting, you know, because whether it's through the spatial or temporal staggering of, you know, removing the lockdown that will, you know, slowly and meanderingly will have to happen. We will also have to think about what are the buttons to be pressed uh, in terms of given the massive shock that has been received by the system. And in a crisis like this, what was unique about it is there's a, both a supply side constraint and a demand side constraint. The supply side constraint is obvious because you can't have, you know, a face to face uh, or the usual kind of, you know, um, uh, physical uh, uh, exposure because of this problem, or you have to do it either through uh, testing and then allowing people to uh, resume normal activities, right? That's the supply side. And the demand side problem really comes from the fact that a lot of people's income and, and, and income is basically uh, income flows have stopped and therefore uh, there is that problem, right? So therefore, in terms of having a coherent framework as to what is the way to restart the economy when both the supply engine and the demand engine, and they are connected by direct wires, of course, has been in trouble. So is there, you know, clearly some loan guarantees are, 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 are you know, can be, of course, uh, justified, but we also have to, you know, look into this, um, you know, um, unfolding set of announcements as to what, uh, what are the kind of coherent thoughts and the only, uh, signals that are coming from the initial announcements is there's a move towards protectionism. So for a number of things, you, you, we are basically saying that we would have to look at domestic sourcing and so on. 
So that's where I think we have to evaluate. And again, I wish we had more concrete information for me to exactly tell you where, where it's doing well and where it's not, not doing so well. So I would say those are my kind of you know, broad uh, remarks in terms of where we are uh, in terms of how we think about the government's uh, uh, reaction uh, to this policy. And I'll just end with one, uh, one kind of general remark, which is I think whether we should have a complete lockdown that clearly has what was carried out. And other than the visibility issue that Devraj mentioned, we could also think of, you know, uh, there are um, other, 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 other ways to, uh, uh, you know, uh, other, other reasons, uh, political or otherwise, that, that uh, could, could underlie that. But the bottom line is that it's a very blanket policy. So therefore, in other words, first item that was missing or only came slowly and hesitatingly is the relief aspect of it. Because you cannot shut down everybody and just say that's how we are going to be until the problem goes away. But then again, where the, you know, and again, I, many people are saying this, but I think it needs to be uh, highlighted. We need to think of more uh, uh, nuanced strategies where testing and, and these things allows you to selective release, which is again somewhat in place. But once again, we have to essentially use finer tools as opposed to a very blanket and, and you know, crude tool, which was initially the whole country being shut down and now certain districts, et cetera. And that's where I think we need to think in terms of you know, using finer tools. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Matresh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ashwini, you looked at differences across different states and at different groups. Maybe you can come in. Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to this panel and uh, also a great beginning by Devraj and Moitrish. I'm going to change track a little bit and look at the gender dimensions of the COVID disease as well as the lockdown in India. And one of the most uh, striking things about India, uh, which is uh, perhaps a little bit different from other countries, is that the absolute frontline health workers that are in charge of contact tracing, that are in charge of collecting basic information on the pandemic are, uh, are a group of workers called the accredited social health activists. And they are all women. Uh, and 900,000 ASHA workers, uh, these women have been designated for COVID-19 management. So it's a huge task force of women going literally from house to house, collecting information about disease incidents and about various other health indicators. And you see their pictures uh, you know, in the newspaper. Some of the brave journalists are actually following them. And there are many things that are striking about those pictures. One is that these women are operating with minimal gear. There's a severe shortage of PPE. Uh, and you see that also with these ASHA women. And therefore, when they are going into households where, contact, where they have to do contact tracing, and when, um, you know, with, with such low rates of testing, they are at a heightened uh, risk of infection. Also, when they're on the road, when they're going in the villages, house to house, they're separated from their families. They are anxious. Their families are anxious. And there have been reports that when they go back to their homes with a short break, they are facing social ostracism. They're facing isolation. They have also faced assault because of the stigma attached to the disease. Their family members are facing assault, even when the family members are not present with them, you know, going from, from house to house. These ASHA workers have been the sort of backbone of the primary healthcare system in India for, uh, for, for over a decade now. And they, their, their problems have never been as much visible uh, as, as they are today. You know, and, and this relates to the visible, invisible part of what, of what Debraj was talking about. You know, suddenly you realize that there are all these workers in India who've been doing amazing uh, work, but we see their contributions only now. These ASHA workers are poorly paid between two, two uh, you know, uh, 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 per month. They have long hours uh, of work, and they're often working uh, seven days a week, especially now when they're going into the field for contact tracing. Uh, in terms of the incidence of the disease, uh, India, uh, like other countries, is not collecting, like several other countries, has not been collecting systematic data on the gendered incidence of COVID. 
but there have been actually six to seven states in India that have been collecting those, uh, you know, those figures. And this relates to the point that Maitrish was making about the fact that different state governments have actually shown different kinds of responses in terms of fighting the pandemic. Now, when you look at the available data, this is just data not on deaths, but this is just infected uh, data. And this sort of broadly corresponds to the trend that you see in other parts of the world as well, which is men are more likely to be infected uh, than women. Although in other parts of the world, you see that men are more likely to die of COVID than women. And we don't have that, that uh, data yet. Now, remember that this is the context. The context behind this data is that uh, testing in India is very low. And testing of women is might even be lower. So what, a lot of what we are seeing may just be a result of insufficient testing. Uh, but, but nevertheless, this is the data that we have. But the gaps in the male-female incidence of COVID are actually a little bit lower than some of the other countries that, uh, that for which this kind of data is available. Now, coming to the lockdown. So in terms of the impact of the disease, it's clear that it's affecting men more than women, at least based on the existing rates of testing. Coming to the impact of the lockdown, one important uh, dimension of the lockdown, which is uh, true in India, it's true of everywhere, is that women, uh, women's access to reproductive health resources uh, goes down during lockdowns, has gone down everywhere. So they lack access to contraception, they lack access to abortion clinics. Children that are being born during lockdown are uh, you know, facing severe shortages uh, in terms of accessing newborn healthcare. There are reports that because the primary healthcare workers are completely focused on the management of COVID, the routine process of vaccinations, which will protect these children in the long run, uh, is getting impaired. And the consequences of missing vaccines is something we're going to see in the future. For example, India had already uh, almost eradicated polio. And there are now reports that children that are due for polio shots are missing those shots. And that's going to have consequences, literally debilitating consequences on large parts of the population few years down the line. So, so that's, and, and there, are, there are other uh, reproductive health um, issues related to women's health, especially that are, uh, you know, uh, are suffering because of the impact, the few, the meager health resources are being devoted now to COVID, um, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to, to the fighting of, of, of COVID. The other uh, aspect of the gender dimension is something that, again, we see elsewhere in the world as well, which is the gender division of household work, domestic chores and care work. Now, South Asia as a region, and India and Pakistan in particular, have amongst the most unequal sharing norms of domestic chores and household work. So women do between six to nine times more hours of domestic work than men do. Okay. Uh, now, the question is, because of the lockdown, because that men are at home, and because Indian middle classes that depend a lot on hired help, which is not being able to, who are not being able to come home, will that change the social norm? And will we actually see the establishment of more equal uh, gender sharing of household chores, that only time will tell. And if that were to happen as a result of the lockdown, I would say that would be a good, good uh, outcome. But we don't know that yet because there's no data yet. The data that we do have from other countries suggests that at least so far, the established patterns of gendered work within the household have not shifted really. And so I don't know whether in India they will shift or not. We'll have to see. Another way in which women are getting badly affected is because of the supply chain disruptions, which means that basic goods are in short supply and they're also more expensive. And because women are primarily responsible for household work and for childcare and for the care of family members, it means that they have to manage all these constraints with paying higher prices. And so just the routine housework, which is already quite onerous, is now that much more difficult because of these shortages and because of the high prices. So that's, that's another very important dimension. And I'm not uh, even going into the question of um, middle-class um, families, which I, I will actually, I do have a short bullet point, but I won't, I won't really talk about that much, which is school closures. You know, everywhere schools are closed. And again, all over the world, including in India, the fact is that school closures affect mothers more. 
and for middle class uh, professionals who are working from home uh, obviously who can be more productive at their at their paid jobs only those who who are not burdened excessively by domestic care work and responsibilities uh, and so there was this very funny tweet uh, which said that the next person who tweets about how productive isaac newton and shakespeare were uh, during the flu pandemic is going to get my 3 year old posted to them right and so we read all these stories about amazing productivity uh, that the pandemic lockdown can uh, can unleash but that can only happen if you don't have the burden of domestic work which women uh, which but these these facts i have to uh, uh, emphasize uh, india shares with almost every other country in the world so these are not uniquely indian phenomena um, the larger point that i want to make and this perhaps might be more true about india than about other parts of the world is that when women have less decision making power if than men both within the household and in governments their needs are less likely to be met their needs are less likely to be vocalized their needs are less likely to be addressed and i think that's something that we have to be absolutely mindful of when we are thinking of the pandemic and when we are thinking of uh, solutions to the pandemic of course as the un women has been talking about it continuously the pandemic is followed by what they are calling the the uh, um shadow pandemic which is an increase in domestic abuse and domestic violence and so country after country as lockdowns are announced there's been a spike to helplines in calls to helplines because women and children are now locked with their abuser inside the home this abuse may or may not be violent but it's certainly within the home and it's pretty serious now the indian police uh, which is the first post port of call for uh women suffering abuse uh have not yet released the data but i was able to get some data from the website of the national commission for women which you have to remember is not the first port of call nobody first goes to the national commission for women and i just compared on some of the counts i compared the complaints made in march and april last year with march and april of this year which has been under lockdown and you see here uh that complaints of domestic violence the right to live with dignity uh these are the two counts on which you see a definite escalation in march and april this year compared to march and april last year and the, this is not a generalized uh, phenomenon because there are other other aspects of violence against women which are not lockdown related in that you don't see an increase so this this increase is definitely lockdown uh, related and we have to remember that apart from the fact that national commission of for women figures are going to be under reports domestic violence and inter intimate pa partner violence and abuse is in general heavily under reported uh, because uh, of the location or where it happens which is within the home and the perpetrator who is typically a partner or somebody very close uh, to the woman so the shadow pandemic is real and it's real in india as well as it is in all other countries now why does this matter well it matters because one of the things that the pandemic has done is that it's exposed the fault lines of inequality in our society and one of those fault lines is gender and having a gender blind policy doesn't mean that you're having a gender neutral policy uh so if you want to if you care about gender equality gender blind is not the way to go that's point number 1 second the pandemic is we are, we are in this for a, for the long haul and you can't countries can't take the view india india cannot take the view no other country can take the view that women's lives can be put on hold for 2 years until we sort all this out so we cannot we cannot do that and most importantly as the example of kerala actually shows the state that moitri is referred to ignoring the gender dimension of covid will actually slow down the fight against covid and i don't have time to go into it but if you focus on the gender dimension then the fight against the pandemic itself will be uh will be better will be more targeted will be better focused and you know to repeat the point which can't be repeated often enough is that when as we focus on flattening the pandemic curve it cannot be at the expense of the shadow pandemic curve you can't say okay we'll flatten this curve and be happy about it and if the shadow pandemic curve rises you know that's just a by product i don't think that's a desirable by product at all and the starting point of uh, uh of formulating a gender focused policy is gender disaggregated data and one of the uh, areas of concern about india in particular is that in general data about the disease and about lockdowns and about the economic impacts uh, a lot of the data are not being made available to researchers and i think this is the time when all hands need to be on deck i think there's a lot of uh, concern there's a lot of care everyone cares 
uh, you know, we all care about India. We all care about the pandemic and its impact. And I think that all of us are willing to do our bit to contribute to knowledge production, to contribute to the fight against the disease. And so data must be made available for researchers and for the scientific community to work on. And one of the key dimensions of this data has to be that the data has to be gender disaggregated because that's the only way in which you can target uh, men and women in terms of the differential impacts that the disease and the uh, lockdowns have on them. This will lead to more effective responses. It will lead to more tailored responses. And a lot of the problems that Debra just showed us earlier in the, in the slides, even many of those have gender dimensions as well. But if we have better data, if we have more information, then we can actually uh, uh, implement policies that would be better targeted. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashwini. You bring up uh, what I think is a general point that, that uh, you know, in many countries and most countries, we don't have this kind of uh, data available for disaggregated for, for gender. So I think this is something that absolutely is, is, is very important. <laughs> Koshik, uh, I sort of asked you to take a little bit more of a sort of bird's eye view. Of course, you're sitting in the middle of it, but if you can bring out what you think are sort of the the, the early lessons from the Indian experience for sort of broader thinking about yeah. this in, in the developing world. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, the broad line that I will take, not surprisingly, is very similar to what uh, the previous uh, uh, speakers took. Uh, it is really all about the trade-off between how focused you are on trying to save lives uh, due to COVID-19 and the word that Debraj was using, I've used something very similar, uh, invisible deaths. I was talking about withering away. Uh, people who suffer from food shortages seldom die actually of the starvation before they, they go by something else. And there is the withering away that takes place, which is not accounted for enough. But let me back up a little bit and say, when it began, right at the beginning uh, with the um, uh, lockdown, the general feeling was that uh, India is a very anarchic society. It was quite impressive how uh, people got into a certain discipline and this happened very quickly. But then the worries were coming very, very quickly after that, that uh, there is another side and we can get a backlash trying to deal with this and we have to worry greatly about the backlash. One general point about emerging economies and um, uh, um, Europe and um, uh, North America is a lot of the reaction, not surprisingly in the beginning, no one had any idea how to handle. So there was a lot of fumbling. There was a very mechanical way in which the emerging economies and more than emerging economies, it's a very interesting belt, which people have talked about. It's sort of around the equator, just above the equator from Latin America, Africa, Asia. The response was you're looking at the data numbers coming in from Europe, from North America, and you are trying to follow similar policies and do even, even better. India, as we know, the lockdown was supposed to be 100% in that Oxford scale, right on top. South Africa was very close to India. So a whole lot of countries came that way. But I want to actually, I'm glad Debrat showed those numbers. I was not planning to drag onto my screen, but I may do that and show you one set of numbers, which is, let me first explain, which is the crude mortality rate, which is number of people dying by COVID divided by the population. And two things over here, the number of people infected is very difficult to measure. It depends on testing. As we know, testing is very poor. COVID deaths are also not accurate, but even if it is double what's happening or treble what's happening, there are some differences which is worth keeping in mind once you do population correction. And since European data is roughly similar sized countries generally come in absolute numbers, you will hear in India people saying that it's the 12th worst affected. And when it turns out that it, the COVID deaths are few, it's treated as something special to India, whereas it is not special to India. It's special to this entire belt. And this is, let me just see if I can drag this in. This is yesterday's numbers. These numbers change by the day. If you take 1 million people and the number dying for every 1 million, in Belgium, it is 756 per million, the COVID deaths. Spain, 576. Uh, U.S., which is uh, because it's so much in the news, lots of people think it's the highest. U.S. is 252. So 756 since Belgium, 252 in USA. Germany has handled it very well. It's being written about all over. 
93 in Germany. Come to the belt that I'm talking about from actually Latin America, Africa, uh, Asia, not just South Asia, but Asia. Argentina, seven. Indonesia, four. Pakistan, three. South Africa, three. India, two. Bangladesh, two. Ethiopia, 0 0.04. Even China, which looms huge in our uh, uh, psychology, is three. So that we are talking of a dimension, even if India's two, you multiply it and say 10 times underreported, so it becomes 20. It's still way below Germany's 93. I'm not saying for a moment, and given that there's that other side of Bolsonaro and crazy people who are saying you ignore all this and treat this like the common cold, not for a moment. But these are also levels of differences you can't ignore altogether. And you have to allow for the fact that there may be other things. So when you do the COVID lockdown, you have to be very, very sensitive, especially in these emerging economies where you have less of an ability to handle what happens to the poor, that there is this trade-off which has to be kept in mind in a very big way. That is the main reason I'm saying. And another point I should say, people immediately jump to this and say, this is just the foothills of where you will go. So it will end up like uh, uh, Europe and United States. So you should just prepare in advance. I don't buy that either. And again, this is a dilemma that I don't know what the right policy is, but you can't always say that it is the foot, uh, foothills of that climb because by that argument, even in 2018, in fact, I've got a very nice uh, full discussion, 27th April, a Massachusetts Medical Society had a major discussion, Bill Gates spoke and others spoke, that we are about to start, we can see a huge pandemic coming up. By the argument that even at the foothills, you should lock down totally, you should have locked down in April uh, uh, 2018 totally. That's surely not right. And this simply brings out the dilemma that whenever you're doing a lockdown well in advance, you have to think of all the trade-offs from trade-offs from health, trade-offs from food chain breaking down, and that's what you have to work on. The first steps in India, India was one of the first countries that acted, and I feel were probably broadly right given our state of knowledge. But now you need a very quick wind down. Another problem that arose in the beginning, and you can see this in the psychology of people you talk to sitting in Mumbai and talking on phone, Zoom, Skype all the time with a whole lot of people, friends, family, and even business groups, that one word people treat as if it's a well-defined term and every country is doing the same thing when you talk of a lockdown. So when you say that the Indian lockdown is up to here, someone will say, well, in France, it is for two more weeks. But the word lockdown has many, many dimensions to it. And there was too little attention being paid to that. If you lock down, schools lock down, factories lock down, um, uh, uh, transportation completely locked down, that's one kind. Then another country that can do it differently. One example I must very quickly take from Africa. Two leaders, African leaders, who are very impressive, who have acted differently. And one of them has got a lot of criticism, a lot of criticism from the West, and I think that's unfair. Um, Abe Ahmed uh, in uh, Ethiopia and Cyril Ramaphosa in South Africa, not totally different policies, but different policies. South Africa went for a massive lockdown, total lockdown, virtually total lockdown. Um, um, Ethiopia went for a lockdown, but much more relaxed. Flights were kept on, schools were stopped, large gatherings were stopped, but many other things were kept on. I've, and this was being criticized very widely. But I feel at one level, this was understandable. What Africa did, and this was referred to by who just now was mentioned, uh, South Africa, after the lockdown, used this period for massively building up the health facilities. Hospitals were being added, beds were being added, facilities were being added. Ethiopia rightly calculated that at about one eighth the per capita income of South Africa, it would not be able to immediately double up hospitals, double up hospitals. It left a lot of the economic functioning open. It was changing closed door markets to open air markets. Markets were being shifted out. I feel these were quite intelligent moves. And if you look at COVID fatality, not that Ethiopia has been slammed and you have to keep in mind, Ethiopia is extremely connected to China. So this is not a Closed economy, people were going back and forth, just like Bangladesh, which has India's, roughly India's numbers in terms of COVID fatality. It's a very peripatetic population going back and forth. So it is the balancing act which we are now realizing. And I'm feeling a bit hopeful because India is now this uh, 
4.0 lockdown, it is being assured that it's going to be done in a much more nuanced way. So what is needed to be done now is you have to very, very carefully break down the components of the lockdown, allow some of them to be freed up, which means that the numbers will probably go up a little bit of COVID when you do that. But we have to learn that we may have to live with this for six months, for one year, for two years. Ashwini was mentioning in the context of gender and other matters, we have to begin to work on those things while being aware of the fact that yes, you will see some fluctuation in these numbers. The COVID incidents may go up, but if you have to live for, with it for two years, you cannot close things down totally. Let me mention one psychological thing, and I'll stop with that. You know, um, if you actually look at many of the risks in everyday life, uh, they are much greater than the COVID risk. For instance, in India, um, in a typical year, close to 200,000 people die from road accidents. The number of people who died of COVID uh, now is uh, three, uh, just short of 3,000. So close to 200,000 people die of road accidents, about 3,000 people die of COVID. When you go out onto the street, you're taking a risk of being hit. I feel we are reacting a bit um, psychologically. There's a fear psychosis, which is excessive. And for a reason that, you know, given COVID and the ex externalities of our bad behavior, we of course have to take lots of precautions. Social distancing is a must. Wearing uh, um, is a must. Wearing uh, um, um, face masks is a must. Washing hands, whole lot of things you have to do. But you must not make the mistake of from that, your own behavior, deducing that the risks are a screaming high risk. That behavior is needed because there is so much external effect on other people, you have to do that. But you must not deduce behavior. I talk about this because I feel it is now time when leaders will have to work on people's psychology to say that as we are easing up the lockdown, you have to begin to take some minimal risks, in fact, kind of risks which you've always taken and begin to function in life, have factories opening up, people will have to move, local trains will have to start off more than long distance trains, local trains will have to start up because otherwise workers can't get to work. And actually one final word, quite apart from the money that you direct, and I have exactly the same concern, it's not the total amount, it's the detail of where it's coming from and how you're spending it, but beyond that, Usually in this debate on the invisible hand, I'm on the other side. But you have to remember that the invisible hand of the market cannot be replaced by money, no matter how carefully it has been worked on. If you lock down the economy totally and try to reach money to various people to support them, you will not manage. It's too complex a mechanism, the invisible hand. You have to create room for the invisible hand to get back into functioning. Just the money, no matter how carefully you do that, that also won't do. It is this balancing act. I don't any, envy anyone who's trying to do it now, but that's the challenge that we face. Let me stop with that. Thank you very much, Kaushik. I'm very happy to see that Yamini managed to join us. So thank you, Yamini. Welcome. Hi. Um, uh, my apologies. That there's a, a massive dust storm in Delhi that just unfolded, and that seemed to have done something to my internet and my phone connectivity just when I was trying to log in. So I got a little de delayed uh, getting there. So I'm sorry to have missed uh, some of the conversation. Um, uh, so uh, uh, please do uh, forgive me if uh, some of the things that I have to say have already been uh, covered, but I wanted to sort of focus my five, six minutes on, on two things. Uh, one was just to uh, sort of give it a broader uh, context of um, some of the big challenges that the lockdown itself uh, has uh, ha has presented for India. Uh, but from, from the perspective uh, of how it is, I think, reshaping uh, or, or, or certainly stressing and sh highlighting fault lines in the nature of the social contract and the nature of citizen-state relations. Um, because I think that is very important to both understanding why we are 
are actually seeing some interesting differences in the federal architecture of India across states, uh, but also what that holds for uh, our future uh, 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 as we try to exit from uh, the, the, both the lockdown as well as the challenges that the lockdown has presented to us. So, you know, I think if you look back to early March, uh, one of the reasons why there was, um, I, you know, a fair amount of elite consensus that uh, the only thing that we needed to do to that we could potentially do to address the challenge that COVID presented was to go into a massive lockdown, although there were very important questions to be asked about the effectiveness of lockdowns in a poor country like ours, came from the fact that our entire health system is traditionally with because of low, low investment and low quality governance, uh, our public health system is really very weak. And in fact, in more ways than one, the challenge that COVID presented for India was even more in uh, exaggerated because uh, if the US can't cope with, uh, with, with an outbreak, uh, then how will India manage with its completely broken health system? And the fact that there is such low trust in our health system, uh, I think uh, legitimized what was uh, quite a, uh, you know, a harsh decision and not, and perhaps from any, from the from point of view of the economics, uh, the right decision to take for, uh, for India uh, at that point. Um, and what happened actually immediately after the announcement of the lockdown, I think was quite unique in some ways, also again, stressing the complicated relationship between citizens and state. As when we went into lockdown, um, the, uh, by and large elites and middle classes uh, and those with means uh, and those who out of fear sort of stayed back and stayed at home and, and, and were willing to be coerced by the state and comply with the new norms. Uh, but those at the margins of society did quite the opposite. In fact, they demonstrated their complete lack of trust in the state and the ability of the state to protect them. And when all means failed, got up and walked and took the and, to, and, and uh, you know, took a very difficult decision to take a very arduous journey home, walking home, rather than being trapped in very inhospitable cities, indicating how their own uh, sort of the, the, the dynamic of the relationship that they have struck with the state is one always of having been on the margins and having been subjected to the violence of the state. And when they lose their means of income, there really is no option for them but to vote with their feet and find a way home. And I think that this combination of uh, a, 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 an elite consensus that had built around a certain form of, beha of, of, of policy behavior that emerged out of a lack of trust in our health systems to be responsive combined with uh, those on the margins choosing to uh, actually defy the norms of the lockdown and walk home uh, because they don't trust in this, ha have very little trust in the state has sort of created this perfect storm that has landed us uh, quite literally for those of us in Delhi today in a storm where uh, we are, where our policymakers are really, I think, struggling to figure out what is the right balance and right way to respond uh, to the challenge that uh, both the, the economic damage of the lockdown lockdown as well as the health consequences of COVID present to them. Uh, and I think states that have done better are in fact, uh, the shining example being Kerala, are states which in fact have very, very robust public systems and which have a social structure and a social uh, context and relationship with the state, which is in fact embedded in trust. Uh, and, and that starts from the local government level all the way up. And those solidarities between communities and between the state have allowed the the state to find slightly less harsh ways of implementing very coercive norms like lockdowns uh, in ways that uh, are at least a little more humane than the lockdown uh, that has been unleashed on many other parts of the country. So I think uh, the, the, the core difference of state by state response to COVID really comes in the context of the, the nature of the public system and the kind of public trust that the state structure has been able to build between citizens and the state to be able to respond to the unique challenges uh, that COVID presents. This, I think, present, lays out a very important uh, concern as we now head in the direction of, uh, uh, con uh, of, of dealing with um, where we are today as we head into the, uh, the, the, the context of trying to find a way to exit out of the lockdown. Um, there, there are two uh, Im important issues. One is because of the lack of solidarity and the lack of trust in, the gov in, in, in government and within government, uh, the response to COVID has been extremely centralized, which I think has 
placed very very deep tensions uh, between the nature of the uh, of the disease itself which by its very nature is very localized you don't experience an outbreak in a in a in the country as a whole you experience the outbreak in a state you experience the outbreak in a district you experience the outbreak in a locality and therefore the response has to be very much aligned to the particular context in which the outbreak has happened but uh, the uh, but uh, the the nationwide response has been so centralized that decision making at the states and local level for the most part uh, has not been able to be effectively responsive to local conditions and that has sort of unleashed the bureaucracy into our everyday lives in in ways that uh, we've never i think experienced before uh, where bureaucrats sitting in new delhi are deciding whether a barber's shop should open up uh, in a local village somewhere far away creating a whole host of other kinds of confusions uh, that have made even managing some of the parts of the economy that we've been trying to open up over these last 3 to 4 weeks uh, or near near impossible so um, there has been a very deep federal strain and uh, as we start thinking about how we exit from the lockdown uh, the fact that this um, we don't actually have robust uh, institutions to manage federal compromises and that there is a lack of trust within the government and between people in the state uh, negotiating those compromises is in fact going to is in fact the biggest challenge that we confront so how are you going to open up across state borders uh, is is going to be a very very critical issue because states are now making these decisions in fact in some ways we are seeing a lot of demand for um, much more federalism but at the same time states themselves are clawing back and i think the, for the first time in our history uh, we are actually seeing states closing off their borders and curbing interstate movement negotiating that we has a direct impact on negotiating supply chains and movement of people and movement of goods and services across the country which impact the economy in a big way um so that i think uh, is the, the the nature of our federal architecture and how we negotiate that is going to be a critical piece of the puzzle that will i think help uh, uh, give us some clues as to how we can exit from the from the lockdown in a way that is 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 sensible and viable that also links to the second aspect of exiting from the lockdown which is how do you uh, 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 strengthen the ability of the health system to manage um and here i think again the centralization uh, 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 and the lack of trust in the health system is is placing unique constraints where now the system is sort of responding to the demand for ramping up testing uh, by just ramping up testing we're not thinking about how one can ramp up testing in a way where testing can become a means of better understanding the nature of the disease and the nature of the outbreaks so that we can take smart uh, localized decisions on how to exit and how to uh, how to contain um, uh, the outbreak so right now in fact there's a very big tussle that is sort of slowly sort of breaking out between the central government's management of the testing structure including the number of kits how we test who we test where we test and how states are trying to respond uh, to the demands of testing um, and it, that tension again i think is going to constrain the ability to make smart local decisions uh, for us to be able to exit the lockdown in a sensible way um, and then last but not the least the big challenge of the lack of trust i think the biggest difficulty that the in indian administration has had in being able to provide even basic relief measures and response uh, to uh, the economic crisis uh, on the most vulnerable communities is also coming from the fact that uh, that our bureaucracy is designed to always be very deeply suspicious of uh, of people and therefore even when it's amply clear and today the finance minister has announced that we are going to convert our uh, public distribution system into a demand system 51 days too late the fear within the system of unleashing localized corruption which will prevent uh, relief measures from reaching the most vulnerable and those who need it causes them to actually overlay all kinds of bureaucracies onto it so you need to have a smartphone you need to get an otp you need to go through all sorts of measures in order to be able to get your entitlement uh, and that i think is going to be a really big hurdle uh, as we try and a provide basic relief but also uh, potentially use cash and um, and and other schemes as a way of infusing demand into the economy at the local level so there is a really urgent need for the for the entire system to in some ways re uh, reorient itself in a way that uh, moves much more in the direction of confidence in you saying of confidence building and trust building between people and markets uh, in order for us to be able to effectively manage this very complicated transition from the lockdown
lockdown into a sort of new business as usual model uh, that I think we inevitably have to because this, this is not going away anytime soon. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Yamini. I'm so glad that you managed to, to, to make it. So, so I'm now going to let in uh, uh, the audience. And, and uh, for those who want to ask the question yourself, please use the raise your hand function. And otherwise, I will uh, use the questions that have been sent in. So I have qu quite a few questions on uh, and relating to what Yamina was saying, you know, the relationship between the, the federal government and the, the, um, and the state. So for example, uh, Biba Saar from Durham University asks, uh, given India's size of spread of virus from east to, uh, west to east, it may take several weeks uh, so the peak of infection for the whole country may stay level for over a month. Should the government then relax lockdown in phases going by regions? You know, how do you establish this? I mean, I, I mean, do you want to have it crack at that? And and there's no. maybe I can also um, there are some other questions in the similar spirit. So, um, for example, um, see if I can find it. Yeah, well. So uh, Pavan Katakam says, you know, we have a three-tier system of administration in India. And, uh, you know, you have the country, the states, and municipalities. And um, you know, particularly the, uh, the resources at the lower levels are, are very limited often. And uh, what can the center do to address these issues? Okay, so um, let me uh, answer this question in two parts. One is about the architecture of our federal system and particularly the f fiscal federal system. And the other is about the politics. And of course, the two uh, are quite uh, neatly intertwined. Um, when it comes to the architecture of our federal system, uh, in fact, uh, as the last uh, speaker, uh, the, the, the last question, the person who raised the question is absolutely right. The most ignored part of our federal architecture are the local governments. And as the experience of Kerala has pointed Pointed out. In fact, uh, robust local governments are almost critical and essential to be able to effectively respond to COVID. And one of the interesting things that has happened is that in across the country, uh, most state governments are now uh, including their local municipalities and rural local governments, particularly the village local governments, in their strategic planning for how to handle various aspects of the implementation of their COVID-related health plans, including contact tracing and maintaining registers uh, of uh, uh, of people and handling uh, ha handling the quarantine and isolation, um, and uh, the, uh, but but the challenge with India and and in the meanwhile state governments who are really at the front lines of because health is by the way a state subject social protection is a concurrent subject, uh, so state governments who ha have really been at the front lines of developing and designing their the response to COVID outbreaks as they are happening uh, are extra staff for funds uh, um, uh, both because of the nature of the fiscal federal design and uh, uh, the, the economic slowdown, which was the context in which uh, COVID uh, sort of uh, the, the COVID outbreak uh, took place. Uh, state revenues were low. The goods and services taxes compensation that was due to states from the federal government had in fact uh, not been paid. Uh, and uh, state, 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 states were in any case in a somewhat fiscally stressed condition. And of course, with this now, their revenues are down uh, by 90%, according to some states. Many have now had to defer salary payments by six months. The state government of Maharashtra announced that it has stalled all its developmental works. So state governments have been looking to the center to use its monetary and fiscal powers uh, to be able to provide it with some kind of financial relief. Uh, very limited relief have been provided thus far. Uh, and in this process, states have been asking for more decentralized decision making, uh, which the center has been uh, unwilling to provide owing to the nature of politics. Uh, but states have also played a double-edged sword. They are using local governments as a, uh, to aid their relief uh, and uh, implementation efforts, but have uh, really done very little to decentralize funds uh, and empower local governments, with, of course, the exception of Kerala, Karnataka to a degree, and a few other states. Uh, what really needs to happen very urgently, um, India has a finance commission, uh, which is based at the center and determines the share of taxes across different levels of government. Uh, the finance commission commitments to local governments uh, are often 
Morgan, uh, uh, with with a lot of very clever accounting jugglery, taken over by states. And so state governments need to now release the Finance Commission entitlements of the 14th Finance Commission and the new entitlements that have been announced for them of the 15th and the Finance Commission immediately. And they need to use their state finance commissions to set up a COVID fund that at least some untied grants can go to local governments so they can perform the functions they are being expected to perform. But by the same token, uh, there is a long menu of uh, uh, requests that state governments have been making to the central government uh, to strengthen their uh, uh, to, to give uh, to, to give them some liquidity so that they are going they can manage uh, the fund crunch that they are facing right now. Uh, one of the interesting things, uh, because of the politics and the party at the center, is a very centralizing one. Um, with as once India decided to go into lockdown, it invoked the Disaster Management Act, which by which is a central act and by definition uh, empowers the government of India. India's home ministry to take decisions. So we've had a very centralized implementation structure as we go into, uh, but uh, now that we are in the last mile of the third lockdown, uh, and I think our prime minister also finds himself in a little bit of a bind trying to figure out how to exit, he has now finally sort of moved decision making to states uh, and asked states to come up with plans, which they are apparently due to do so in the next few days, to determine how they want to exit and in what form they want to exit. So the politics first centralized decision making because the central government party wanted to take full ownership of how to handle the COVID crisis. And the politics is also now opening up decision making uh, as the tough decisions are sort of being devolved to state governments, who also, by the way, are a little nervous about making these decisions themselves, and many of which are still choosing to stay longer in lockdown. And it is in this negotiation that the absence of strong, robust federal institutions is really going to be difficult for India. It somehow reminds us of another uh, big democracy <laughs> trying to put the, the pressure on, on the state. Um, Deborah, do you want, you want to come in quickly? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to quickly follow up on what uh, Yamini said. You know, there's an interesting uh, tension over here because the more the states are strangled, the, because the health is a state subject, the more the states would actually not want to exit this lockdown. Okay. Uh, the, the, the states are petrified that if now we start an exit process, they will not be able to handle it. So I think these, these two things are going in tandem. And it's, I think it's very important. You know, for example, GST revenues are way down and there are areas in the GST. When oil prices went up, the center quickly stepped in and, and, and placed a tariff so that the states can't take advantage of that. The states cannot live off liquor, right? Essentially, we are down to a situation where the states are living off alcohol and, and everything else is in the hands of the center. So I think going back also to this fiscal versus liquidity stimulus, I think all these transfers should be simplified and sent down to the states so that they can then in turn, as Yamini was saying, pass it on uh, to the local level. Okay. This will also increase the incentive of the states to start off an exit strategy from the lockdown. So I think these two things work in tandem. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So there have been a couple of questions for you, but I wanted to, one which was um, about uh, what's happening to food prices and, and, and how that will have a differential impact on, on men and women. And so I, can you say something about, you know, what, what's happening in terms of uh, food, the food uh, uh, markets and food prices and food security and, and maybe also the gender dimension of that. So food prices is one thing, food security is the other question. So food yeah. prices, because of the supply chain disruptions, it's a very peculiar phenomenon that there's actually food in plenty at source, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not being made available to the consumers, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the part that's making it hard. In fact, there are pictures just horrible pictures of farmers throwing away their produce or vegetables because there's no, they can't get them to the mandi, they, they can't get them to the market. So there's a mismatch between, so there's enough supply in general, but it's not reaching the consumers. So that's the food supply issue. Now, my, the point that I was making is that in a situation where the woman is primarily responsible for feeding her family and her uh, children and, uh, you know, she's, she's, she's in charge, she's, the pressure of having to manage with goods not being available and the goods that are available at much higher prices puts an undue pressure on the woman relative to the man because she's the one who's providing for the family. So that's the point that I was making. In terms of food security, it's this public distribution system that everybody else has referred to. And one of the things that 
almost everybody has said uh, in who's intervening in the indian discourse is that the food corporation of india is sitting on huge stocks of food grain and all virtually every commentator has said that now is the time to release those stocks and literally give it for pe to people so that you enable you uh, you uh, you ward off starvation right so that's 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 a food security issue but my point i was about more about the supply chain disruptions and women having to manage with less and with more expensive stuff and manage having to take tough decisions within households on a daily basis and that has also mental health consequences apart from other things as well hello sir so uh, sir uh, i have two questions one is uh, i just wanted to know from the panelist that india had done a uh, demonetization drive in 2017 18 and uh, do you do you think that demonetization drive has been some kind of a lesson to implement this corona virus lockdown this is my first question and my second question is uh, it has been seen that most of the states in india which have actually been able to curb the lock, uh, curb, curb the effects of corona virus virus have been smaller states so do you think uh, lim uh, delimitation is the way forward in terms of uh, administ administering uh, such health pandemics in the future thank you Thank you very much. Thank you. Who wants to have a grab? I don't understand the question yeah. about demonetization yeah. and. No, I think I was. I guess the the the, the, the uh, claim was that, you know, you, there was, the demonetization was not viewed probably as a great success in terms of implementation and and were there, you know, important lessons from that that has made this more effective. I think. On the contrary. Maybe what you are suggesting on the contrary. <laughs> On the contrary, demonetization was viewed as Moitrish will tell you he's written about it is uh, was as viewed as a great success apparently, uh, and this is a huge problem. All that demonetization has taught us is uh, that excessive centralization is the way out, and it's exactly the opposite that we should, uh, it, it, which is the lesson that we should be learning. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, on, on that question of small versus big states, to me, the real lesson from uh, uh, from this whole thing is uh, that a robust uh, governance institutions, particularly at the local level, uh, is what uh, is most effective in dealing with uh, a pandemic. Actually, it is most effective in building state society trust. And that's why I, uh, I, I, I think that lesson I've taken away from uh, this whole experience is, is the more robust our governance institutions are and the, most, uh, the stronger relationships that it builds at the local level, the more effectively we can deal with uh, both uh, business as usual as well as, as well as crisis. It's not about the size of state, it's about how effectively a state is governed. Unless there are other questions, I, I was just reading some of the questions and I think yeah. one, uh, Koshik had brought up this very important point about different death rates and mm -hmm. um, whether that justifies us moving a bit more bravely into a relaxed lockdown thing. And I'm, I'm wondering whether Koshi wants to talk a little bit more about that or? You may be to follow up there because of course, as you say, uh, you know, one interpretation, and if you talk to epidemiologists, uh, as I do quite a lot these days, you know, they would say that you are at the foot of the mountain. And, and, and uh, so, and, and of course, there may be many other interpretations, but, but please Koshi. Can I come in? It's the foot of the mountain. I, I, I do worry that we were at the foot of the mountain in 2018. Yeah. And you can't do a total lockdown. Uh, yeah. Everything frozen because of that. So I yeah. do believe these numbers are important. And mm -hmm. another thing, and this relates to what Yamini was saying, Debraj and others, is uh, also the state decentralization. One problem that will arise, it's been fit in, stuck into our heads so much that because of the lockdown, our numbers are small. Though across the belt, countries with different kinds of lockdowns have very similar um, uh, mm -hmm. COVID incidents and death. Mm -hmm. But because it's so associated, each chief minister is going to be terrified. If after I unwind a little, if the numbers go up even slightly, people will politically come tumbling down on me. So I feel, in fact, we are going to get this very strange equilibrium of no one wanting to take the first step forward out. And here there is, in fact, there should be a central responsibility the other way to sort of egg them on that look, then there are differences and you have to take that into realistically account and begin to ease up. And of course, when it comes to money and decentralization, I'm completely with you. Even if you're using the central bank to demonetize some of the deficit, 
that should be distributed to states so that they can begin to act on that. Yeah. No, absolutely, Kaushik. I completely agree with you. And in fact, I think one of the, there also the communication and messaging is really crucial and where the medical community has to come in. Because I think one of the big challenges in interacting with state governments, especially on the issue of testing that is coming up again and again, is that, uh, you know, uh, they are all aware that especially now that migrants are going moving back that the numbers are going to rise and the numbers are going to rise exponentially the media is telling you you know i mean more people die every day of tb frankly than they they they, they do of of they have thus far of covid uh, th thankfully i suppose but the kind of hype uh, that has been created everyone is really frightened of the increase in numbers what they are not being able to do is to say how do i use the current the, the sort of uh, the, the pool of uh, the, the kitty of options that I have uh, on the medical side to be able to make better decisions. So the testing has just become right. something that you have to just ramp up. It's like, you yeah. know, every day a state government will call you and say, you know, I'm under real political pressure to say I'm out competing the other state on the total number of tests that I'm doing. What we and we've started moving in this mission mode without thinking that actually you should be using your tests for medical decisions and for economic decisions. So how do I design my testing strategy in a way where it's not how many tests that I'm doing, but how I'm doing them to be able to make sensible decisions. And there, I think the combination of ICMR changing its mind every day about what you can and cannot do, which is sort of bringing its own sets of problems, as well as the fact that the medical community is not working together with the policymaking community to think sensibly about how to exit the lockdown, which is causing you know, and you're absolutely right. Chief ministers are really scared because if, if as the numbers do go up, they are going, nobody wants to have death on their hands. Let me pose this question and, and it sort of relates to ma many of the things that were just said. You know, I think when, when you bring together sort of thinking of epidemiologists and economists, what you see is that um, actually the ep epidemiologists, they focus on the evolution of, a, um, of the epidemic without thinking about individual choices. And, and when, you're, when you are um, introducing economics, you'll get, even in a world where there's no lockdown policies at all, people will socially distance and you will get a drop in output and, and so on. And so my question is, if you look at the Indian experience and you look maybe globally, I said in the introduction, that it's su surprising how, ambitious these lockdown strategies have been across countries in, in a developing and emerging world. Could it be that is exactly because you have, a, you have this sort of natural inclination of people to, to move in voluntarily into uh, socially distancing themselves? And one way to ensure that others do it too is to support a lockdown overall. And by encouraging the government to impose lockdown on others, you can actually reduce the time that you have to stay in lockdown. I'm putting that to you as a sort of, it's a way of thinking about um, why we see these uh, very strong, strict lockdown policies in many developing and emerging countries, that people are actually, they're aware of the limitations of the healthcare systems. They are aware of the fact that many people will be inclined to break the lockdown or their social distancing because they are just desperate to to find uh, earn a living and so on maybe that's why we see these very strong reactions in so many countries it's just striking india is a, maybe an extreme case but actually if you look at the numbers uh, the oxford measures are actually much higher for for um, developing countries than for for um, for advanced economies just to put it to you, any or any spontaneous reactions to that way of thinking. Well, I wanted to say, you know, it's, it's certainly true that the baseline epidemiological models are completely non-behavioral. And as a result, this sort of informed the early reaction that you need very strong interventions, right? Mm -hmm. Now, every economist who has ever read an epidemiological model will know that this stuff doesn't make any sense at all. There's no such thing as a contagion rate in a vacuum, right? So individuals uh, socially distanced by themselves and therefore bend the curve. The, but the issue is whether this amount of bending is enough to implement some sort of socially optimal outcome. Yeah. Is there still a gap, right, between equilibrium behavior and the socially optimal outcome? In India, I think, 
you know, in, 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 you know in, in countries where there is a very large share of older people in the population, I think that gap is quite substantial. Okay, and you see this what happened in Italy, right? Uh, uh, where young people live side by side with old people. Now in India, it's also true that young people live side by side with old people, but there aren't that many old people. Okay, uh, you know, 8% or maybe less of the population is over 60 years of age. Uh, whereas in Italy, that number is a quarter of the population. Now, actually, if you, if you feed those age distributions into the Indian mortality rates, I don't know if Koshik is still around, but this is a point that he raised. If you feed the numbers in, you can actually understand why the Indian case fatality rates are so low. The Indian case fatality rates are low, not because India is a hot and humid country or somehow we are doing a better job. In fact, if you adjust for the, for the age distribution, the Indian fatality rates are actually higher than what would be predicted by using age-based uh, fatality rates uh, from Italy or Spain. But the fact of the matter is that we have a lot more room here to entertain a relaxed lockdown. And I, and I would love to hear what Yamini and, and Moitrish think about this. Uh, before we sort of close up uh, on the matter. Mitresh, can we have some last comments from you? Yeah, no, I think uh, just a few remarks and I, again, uh, there were lots of interesting questions and we have, of course, run out of time. Uh, and, you know, thanks to everybody for our very, very interesting uh, remarks. So my kind of, you know, parting thought would be the following, that um, essentially when we talk about uh, the broad approach of the government, these are all in this centralized as was discussed, but going back to choices and epidemiologists not sort of, you know, um, putting this into their thinking and economists, of course, that's where we start from. Well, essentially all these policies are in the way of constraining behavior. To exercise choices, you need relaxation of constraints and also you need resources. Otherwise I would might want to choose lots of things, but my resources do not permit me. Mm -hmm. So therefore, and given the centralized structure and the federal state coordination issues that we're pointing out, I think we need more fungible uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, avenues of resource allocation given the broad constraints that every country is facing. And in particular, therefore, I would like to revisit uh, the point that was, uh, you know, many, many have mentioned that before the crisis hit, it was a general consensus is a demand constrained uh, situation, right? So therefore, the need for cash transfers, okay, I think is extremely strong. This is not to deny that's not sufficient because there are supply constraints and of course the supply chains are broken, et cetera. And that's where some of the, you know, allowing informal channels to work because after all, how are people still getting some supplies? It is because of some of those informal channels that, that are operating. I think we should have less faith in this more heavy handed constraining type things and having a more enabling approach. Yamini, you'll get the last word. <laughs> no, thank you. And uh, uh, I, I think, you know, to me, the big puzzle of this whole uh, uh, unfolding story of the last two, three months in India has been about the about the about the why of the kind of choices that we made in March, uh, and and I think uh, you know that the combination of what the epidemiologic epidemiologist community were saying about uh, the potential of the disease, the collapse that we saw in in, in the West, uh, which I think for India really came as a surprise, and the uh, the complete uh, lack of trust in uh, the even imagining the possibility that we can strengthen the health system, at least on the margin, so that we are able to deal with the challenge. I think it just closed off the space for us to look for alternative options. Uh, this just became the thing that we had to do and we went about doing it. Uh, and now we are bearing the consequences, uh, I, I, I think, of it. So I, I really do think that the only sensible way of uh, going to a world in which we have to manage to live with COVID, and now many of our policymakers are also finally using phrases like learning to live with the disease is if we start saying, you know, whatever our failures as a country, we do manage to come together sometimes to get a few things done.
done right. So let's just put a mission mode like crazy massive effort on sensibly strengthening the margins of our health capacity so that we are able to deal with a hospital surge, God forbid, if it happens. Uh, and, 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 and also decentralize decision making in a sensible way uh, so that the economy can at least slowly come back on its tracks. Uh, and all the other, you know, my, what Maitresh was saying about addressing uh, the, you know, we, we have been in a demand crisis. It's only now getting uh, exaggerated and exacerbated. We need to really make a massive push to move money. We have the means to do it. Uh, today, our FM seems to have announced a bevy of measures, none of which are really indicating, at least in the quick reading I did before coming on, uh, what the sort of fiscal stimulus truly, truly is. And I think that whatever is holding back our political establishment, they need to just loosen it out. Otherwise, the dangers uh, that we confront going forward are really going to be significant. I think that we may well walk into serious social unrest if we are not able to address these things uh, upfront now. This is probably our last chance. Well, thank you so much. I think it's been a fascinating discussion with, of course, very important implications for India itself, but I think there are many more general lessons about how to do these policies and how to put in place, particularly how to reach those most vulnerable and how to use fiscal resources in the most effective way. Uh, I'm very grateful for you to, for taking the time and, and the audience has been fantastic. 35 questions and, and uh, you know, we have not been able to answer all of them. We will keep track of them and, and I'll try to provide them to different participants uh, in the panel to maybe answer them uh, in, in more directly. But uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and, and uh, be safe. Thank you.